The calculus, one of the most basic and fundamental tools of modern mathematics. Two men can rightly claim to have invented it, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Newton actually discovered his calculus first, in 1665 or 1666. Leibniz made his own independent discovery of it some ten years later. However, neither man saw fit to publish what they'd found for some years after that. What's really fascinating is that the original writings recording the discoveries of both of these men are preserved. In the University Library in Cambridge, we have the notebooks that Newton kept between 1665 and 1667. And in Hanover, Leibniz's notes from 1676 are preserved as well. They provide a fascinating glimpse into the process of mathematical discovery that both of these men used, and it's really exciting to be able to study them. We start our story with Newton. Newton was a student at Trinity College, Cambridge, and in January 1665, he took his degree and became Bachelor of Arts. There then followed two years of intense work in which many of Newton's basic ideas on the calculus, as well as optics and gravitation, were formed. We shall restrict ourselves to his mathematics. In May 1665, Newton was working in Cambridge. He was rapidly mastering and improving on the methods of Descartes and Hudder for finding tangents. The contemporary way of finding a tangent to a polynomial curve, that is, a curve with a polynomial equation, was as follows. To find the tangent to this curve at the point P, look at circles with centres on the x-axis passing through P. Most circles will cross the curve at P and recross it at another point, but one circle will just touch the curve at P. The line from the centre of this circle to P is called a normal and the line at right angles to this normal through P is the tangent to both the circle and the curve. Hudder, who was a smart mathematician, had developed a cunning way of finding the centre of this circle, which used the following trick invented by Fermat. In general, a circle cuts the curve in two places. Suppose this distance is O. Now find an expression for the distance D of the centre of the circle from some convenient reference point in terms of O. Finally, assume that O actually has a value of zero. The procedure gives a value for D. And so the centre of the circle and the normal CP can be found. This method was reliable in practice, but it could be complicated to apply. This is what Newton called his waste book, in which he kept entries on a vast number of different topics. And these are the mathematical pages which have been taken out and rebound. Here, on the 20th of May, 1665, he made a note which makes it clear that he had mastered these techniques for finding normals and tangents. On this very page, he writes that he has a universal theorem for tangents to crooked lines. Now, Newton was well aware that tangent problems and area problems were inverse to one another. So every time he solved a tangent problem, he'd solve the corresponding area problem. And he wrote that up as such. Here, in this little book, he presents a method whereby to square those crooked lines which may be squared. Squared means area. It was the standard terminology of the time. And here, he starts writing down the results. 3x squared equals ay, the parabola a square or area, x cubed over a. 4x cubed equals a squared y, has square or area, x to the fourth over a squared, and so on down the page. Given the equation of a curve, Newton starts by writing out tables of values for the area under the curve. So by summer 1665, Newton has mastered the techniques of Descartes and Hudder for finding tangents to curves. He's also used the inverse relationship between tangents and areas to write down the areas under lots of curves. And he finishes by writing down a result which summarises the pattern that he has noticed. 
if a x to the m equals b y to the n, then n x y over n plus m is the area under the curve described by y. In the autumn of 1665, Newton returned to calculating tangents. Calculating tangents is generally Newton's main aim. But now he had switched his attention to mechanical curves. Mechanical curves are curves defined by motion rather than by polynomial equations. The most famous of these is probably the cycloid. A cycloid is the path traced out by a point on the circumference of a rolling circle. A tangent to this curve can be thought of as the instantaneous direction of motion of a point as it traces out the curve. For the cycloid, this direction of motion can be worked out as follows. At this instant, the point on the circumference of the circle is moving with equal speeds in the direction the circle is rolling and along a tangent to the circle. Combining these two speeds using the parallelogram rule gives this direction of the tangent. This idea of instantaneous direction of motion was not new. Kepler, Galileo, Torricelli and Roberval had all exploited it, but none had ever really understood it. Newton dived in, copying much of what had been done before and making the same mistakes. Following the traditional method of the time, a point on an Archimedean spiral would appear to have velocities in these two directions. So combining the two gives the tangent. For the ellipse, the length a plus the length b is a constant. So, at any instant, the speed with which a is increasing must equal the speed with which b is decreasing. So using the parallelogram law, the diagonal gives the direction of the tangent. These sort of constructions do indeed give tangents, but for completely wrong reasons, as was shown when applied to the quadratrix. The quadratrix is formed by tracing the path of the point of intersection of a horizontal line moving downwards with uniform velocity and a line rotating with constant velocity about the origin. The method used for the spiral and ellipse says that the tangent at this point should be a combination of speeds in these two directions. It clearly didn't work. Several mathematicians, including Descartes and Roberval, attempted to modify the method. But none seemed to work really satisfactorily. However, when Newton had perfected his method some months later, he returned to this problem and worked out what the correct construction should be. This work with mechanical curves seems to have given Newton a new way of looking at all curves. This is how Newton now perceived of a curve. Simultaneously, two points move along in the x direction and along the y direction. The distance moved along the y axis at any time is related to the distance moved along the x axis by some relationship which may be a polynomial equation but could also be some sort of mechanical link. So, by interconnecting these two movements, a curve would be drawn. But what Newton was interested in was working out the ratio of the velocities of these two points. He knew what the curve was, however it was defined. So he knew how any distance along one axis was related to a distance along the other axis. But Newton's concept of the way this curve was generated was by movement. And what Newton wanted to know was how the velocities of the two points were related. This was a fundamental perception of the problem, and on November the 13th, 1665, it led Newton to give a new method for finding tangents. He starts by going back to curves he knows, and shows how to find the ratio of the velocity q of y to the velocity p of x. Basically, he lets an infinitely small amount of time elapse in which the point moves from x, y, to x plus little o, y plus little o q over p. He writes, what is x and y in one moment will be x plus little o and y plus little o q over p 
in the next. So x plus little o, y plus little o, q over p, is a point on the curve. That means he can replace x by x plus little o, y by y plus little o, q over p, in the equation of the curve. And then let little o take the value 0, a perfectly systematic method and not dissimilar from what we do today. Newton seizes on the idea that the ratio of q over p, that is the ratio of the velocities, will give him the direction of the tangent. He then writes this very important page, in which he claims that the method is completely general, to draw tangents, he says, to crooked lines, however they may be related to straight ones. Now he's completely certain that his method will give him the tangents at all curves and all points, and he says, hitherto, may be reduced the manner of drawing tangents to mechanical lines, see folio 50. Folio 50 was his earlier and incorrect method for drawing tangents to mechanical lines. So now he has a method for finding tangents to all curves. In particular, he can find the tangent to the quadratrix, the first time this had been done in complete generality. So this page marks an important step in the development of the calculus. Not only is it completely general, but when it's applied to curves given by polynomial equations, it allows Newton to use the rules he had before for finding tangents, but without the need for Huda's complicated calculations. It's still mathematically imprecise, though. Not only is there the question of relating geometrical constructions for tangents to instantaneous velocities, there's the business of relating velocities to movements in infinitely small amounts of time. Through the winter of 1665, Newton ponders the concept of velocities. Then, in May of 1666, he starts to write up his results. Here he says, instead of the ordinary method, it will be convenient and perhaps more natural to use this. Namely, to find the motion 